This evening, if anyone thinks that water in this world is not important, I don't know what else I got for you. Try going through life without water and it's going to be mighty hard. I almost put the graphic up here of water, the necessity of life, because it makes coffee. I figured there'd be a couple in the audience this evening that might appreciate that one. But instead, I went a little more generic, so that way it encompasses even us non-coffee drinkers. And just went with, very simply, the importance of water. Yes, it can make coffee, but it can also do so many more things. Water is, is, is a very important element to our survival. After all, our bodies have a majority of water in them. Uh, the earth is majority of water. A lot of things require water. So much so that God had from the very beginning, if we can go to Genesis chapter 1, and we can see where water was already here before he started forming everything. All the way back in the beginning. He had to separate out some things on day two so that we could even be able to have all the land and waters and put them all in their places. So if it's that important that it's here from the creation, Kind of curious to see what else is it good for. And looking at a couple of examples that we have throughout Old Testament, New Testament, and what it means to us today. It is important to note on the front end of this that water itself is not the end-all be-all. It is not what saves us in itself. We must be willing to use it appropriately and in, accord in accordance with God's commands. Water is just a tool authorized by God and not the solution. I want to go ahead and put that out there now before we even dive in the lesson. It's not just about the water. Even in the Old Testament when it was used and the examples we're going to look at, it wasn't the water only. The water was used, but so was obedience to God. And that is the importance of water is that we use it appropriately. Like anything, we can take in... For our own body's hydration, we can drink enough water to stay hydrated. It is possible to drink too much water and hurt ourselves. It's also very easy for us not to drink enough and hurt ourselves. So the importance of using it correctly may have been a better title there, but you know we have what we have. We can look at our immediate needs of water of you know as a human. You know, we can survive a lot longer without food than we can without water. Water, depending on the source, depending on your activity level, three to seven days at the most, we can survive without water. Obviously, we're in a farming community. Water is gr heavily used for being able to grow crops so that we can eat later. We've been studying in Genesis during the Sunday mornings about the uh, years of plenty, then the years of famine, where there was no water coming to help harvest the crops or let them grow, and it took a major toll. Look at what happens when we don't have water. When we don't have the rain, the, uh, the, the farmers have to go to the irrigation wells, and they really don't like that. It takes out of their profits. However we get the water, they need water for growth. And then look at our daily, daily life. How many ways do we use water? Yes, we use it to, for the coffee drinkers. They make their coffee so that uh, the rest of us can be around them. Hopefully not out of this crowd, but uh, you know, the, the, the stereotype of coffee drinkers is, you don't talk to me till I've had my coffee. I need my coffee first. Hopefully not with this crowd here, but we do have the ability to bathe so that we're pleasant to be around by everyone else. We can clean with it, cook with it, use it for creating other elements. Think about the bricks that are made in holding this building up. Water was used to help form the concrete and do all of this. So the versatility of water is enormous. And we start in the Old Testament again. Like I did this morning, we'll start in the Old Testament and then we'll move into the New. But a couple of uses of water was that one of the first times I really see it and the biggest examples I think of was when there was a worldwide destruction by water 
but yet it was also used to save eight souls. We can look at Genesis chapter 7 and verse 17 beginning. Now the flood was on the earth forty days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the hills, the high hills uh, under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed fifteen cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was breath of the spirit of life, all that was on dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping things, birds of the air, they were destroyed from the earth. So the destructive nature of water. But we also see only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth for 150 days. We see where eight souls, and we see that in 1 Peter 3.20, whereby eight souls were saved by water. It's with the water that the eight souls were saved. How did they have to be in order to be saved. They had to be with Noah on the ark. In the ark. Sort of thinking about that one too is that if we think about the ark, you know, the birds of the air, hey, I'm going to find a dry spot. They may have been camping out on top of the ark for a little while too, while all the, when all the waters raised up. But started thinking about it, there is no food for them to get. Eventually, they would be no more. They wouldn't have food. They wouldn't have the ability to uh, gain the things they needed. So even if they were trying to hitchhike a ride, it wouldn't last very long. You had to be inside. Inside the safety of where God said you had to be. God gave all mankind the opportunity. Through the mouth of Noah as he uh, built the ark for a hundred years. And yet only eight souls got where they were supposed to get to be safe. Through the water, it accomplished God's task of purging the earth of all the evil, but it also accomplished God's task and desire that eight souls were saved. It can be used as a barrier. It can be used as a tool of salvation. Either direction. Another example of the Old Testament is if we go forward to Exodus chapter 14, we see where the nation of Israel was saved because of water. But again, it has a flip side to it. There was the Egyptians that were in hot pursuit and chasing after them perished. Exodus 14, starting in verse 21, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind, all that night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground and the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. Can you even imagine even in the dry times here when all of a sudden the Mississippi River was low, you go down there and you start seeing areas that we've never seen before. They've been, uh, uh, they are now visible to us. You go down there and step on it, it's going to be mighty wet. But God took and caused a wind to make a barrier all night long. When you stop and think of how many thousands of people were actually walking this pathway, how much possession they had, everything else. It took some time for the entire nation of Israel to cross the Red Sea. And he kept that open all night. 
And it came to pass in the morning wash that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. First off, I'm astonished at the, uh, the, the focus these men had. I've never seen anything like this before where God, where the waters are parted on both sides and they just walked across the sea. I guess they said, well, Pharaoh commanded us to go get them and since they could do it, I can do it and chased after them. Then all of a sudden, every single one of their wheels fell off of every single chariot and they got a little spooked. It's not uncommon, perhaps, for one to fall off here and there, but I don't think that the entire army would all fall off at the same time. And they said, uh-uh, we're done. We'll go face Pharaoh and see the consequences there instead. They said, let us flee. Then, Moses, then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, and the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. God worked through Moses. He used water as a medium. But it was more than just the water. Moses at the beginning, we see in verse 21, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back. And then we see here in verse 26, the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may return. And verse 27, and Moses stretched out his hand. It's not just the water that saves us, it's our obedience to God that saves us. But water is an important step of this. That is the tool that he chose to use. We can also look at uh, beyond this point here as they start wandering in the wilderness. We see at least in two places that I could find, Exodus 17 and Numbers 20, where Moses spoke or struck a rock for water to come out so that the nation would not die of dehydration. They could feed themselves. They could feed their animals. They could be nourished. Water again was used to save the people. But Moses had to do something for that to occur. As we move forward to the New Testament, we see something very pivotal in pivotal in the way water is used we now see the way we are commanded we see the old testament for our learning we see the new testament for our following so much so that christ himself that jesus god's only son said permit it to be so when he went to be baptized something that was kind of new around um, you know, apparently they took to it because uh, uh, John was out baptizing with water, preaching that the kingdom of God is coming. And Jesus went to him. He already had knowledge of God. He was already starting to do a few things and understand, had the understanding, much like we do today. You know, as we learn about God, we learn about what he wants. We start to be more involved. We start to ask questions. We start to do a little more. But before we can work for God, we have to be His. Before we are a child of God, we have to go through the steps to become a child of His. Now, Jesus is a different situation here. He is God's Son. But He said, let me show you how it's done. Not exactly in those words, but if we look here in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 through 17, he says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me? But Jesus' answer said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness and he allowed it to be so when he was baptized jesus came immediately from the water permit it now to fulfill all righteousness 
When someone says water is not necessary to be pleasing unto God, I want them to explain to me this verse. When the Son of Man, the Son of God, says, permit it to be so to fulfill righteousness, how is it that's not necessary? How is water not a necessary step of our salvation? Even the Son of Man did it before he went about his journey. I started thinking about this more, and I think about the verses of, you know, Lord, Lord, have we not done all these things in your name? And he says, I never knew you. Did we start with the right steps? Did we allow the water to be an important part of our journey? Notice an important part of the journey, not the end all be all, not the salvation piece itself. Our salvation is obedience to God. Jesus said we must fulfill all righteousness. We must do what the God has commanded us to do. And not only is it recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, but it's also in John. Some There are very few things, and I don't want to say very few, not everything that was done is recorded in all four Gospels. This is. All four Gospels record this account. That speaks volumes as well. All four said this must be in our Gospel. Makes me think that there's something to it. More than anything else that they say because... Anything that is written is by the inspired word of God, but yet all four were inspired to write this. It might be important. Jesus commands the use of water in baptism. When we look forward towards later in his ministry in Mark 16, 16, he tells them, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Some versions say shall be saved, but you know, if we are be believing and believing an ongoing thing and actually believing unto obedience, then we will be baptized. If we are believing unto obedience and we are baptized as we have been told, then we shall be saved. He has promised it to the obedient, to the faithful. We have Christ's example of going to the Jordan. Now, we don't have to be baptized in the Jordan, but we do have to be baptized through immersion for the forgiveness of our sins. And saying that, it kind of brings us to the next point of that the baptism is to receive repentance and forgiveness of sins. There's a reason we must do this. We go to Christ. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 44. Then he said unto them, Christ saying, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, Thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but you tear in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with the power from on high. Jesus said, if you believe and are baptized, what are we believing? We're believing what Christ just told them here, that it is written and thus necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day. Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Baptism is a way to allow us to get closer to Him. In order to receive this, we must go through Him. If we back up, or I'm sorry, going forward into the book of John, he states it very simply. In order to receive, we must go through Him. John chapter 14 and verse uh, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we look down into verse 23, we find out how we do this. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and the Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. 
Unfortunately, he, the next verse also says, He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Do we truly love Christ? Do we truly listen to what God's word has to say? If so, then we will believe what he has to say. We will listen about the words for repentance and forgiveness. We will believe the words when Christ says, let it be so to fulfill all righteousness. For us today, we also see the importance of baptism. We're able to understand it more fully because unlike the disciples that were living it at the time, they were still confused. They didn't understand all the elements of it. They didn't understand the fulfillment of prophecy. Today we get to study that. We get to look today and we see, as described in Romans chapter 6, Start in verse 3. Do we not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into His death? Look at the steps of baptism. We go to the water as a sinful person trying to shed our sinful self just as Christ, who was an innocent man dying for our sins, went to the cross. We crucify ourself by submitting to the death and burial spiritually to the watery grave of baptism. As Christ died, He went to the grave. He was buried. He was buried physically inside of a grave. We going down into the water, being fully immersed and covered, we are down inside the grave of death. And then we resurrect with Him. A new life. Christ came out different. He came out in spirit. He came out conquering death anew. We come out of the watery grave of baptism anew, living without the burden of our prior sins, forgiven as we have repented from them, as we go to live a new day. Romans 6.3 and Galatians 3.26 tell us how we get into Christ. We are baptized into Him. If we want to live that new life, we do that through the watery grave of baptism. Water is essential. It's not the only thing. It is not the thing that saves us. It is our obedience that saves us as we get to look at, and I've put these down for self-reflection and study. Looking at the examples that are given we, you know, on the outline, Jesus Himself we see the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2. We see throughout the book of Acts several who chose to let go of their former self and obey God. Obey the commandments given, the Ethiopian eunuch. Here is much water. What hinders me from being baptized? And then he went on his way rejoicing because he was able to become one with Christ. Saul of Tarsus was not told to, oh, you saw the great light, you are good forever. No. Go into the city and it will be told you what you must do. And he was told by Ananias, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. And he went. Cornelius and his household, Lydia, the Philippian jailer, each of them obeyed the commandment of baptism and are recorded for our reading, for our study, and they've been the accounts and locations are here for personal reflection. They obeyed the teaching of the apostles, which is the teaching of Christ, which Christ says came from my Father. When we stop and think about it. We see the mirror of our physical baptism to the death of Christ through baptism. Continue reading through chapter 6 of Romans and it gives that full illustration there. I just read that single verse for tonight. Again, it is not the water that saves us, but faith that leads us to the actions of following God's commandments. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. 
not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but an answer of a good conscience towards God. Sounds very similar to what Jesus said to John. Let it be to fulfill all righteousness. As we go to Christ, we go to hear His Word, we go to listen to Him, and many times we see that in the Scriptures. We see that also in John 4 and, uh, in verse, and in chapter 7, where He says that the water I give will quench your thirst. Not physical water that we can find in a cup or grab out of a water bottle, but the Word of life being described as an ever flow of water. Do we go to Him to let our spirits be quenched? There is sometimes that feeling within us of like, I need something, I am missing something, I am desiring something. Is that desire for God? If we have been baptized into Him, if we have recognized the importance of water and gone to Him, do we seek Him? Do we seek to know Him better? Do we seek to know our spouses better? Our children better? Our friends better? Why don't we seek God the same way? Or even more than we do our own friends, neighbors, relatives. Do we seek Him? Do we look for that water that, that will quench our spirit? So that we don't have to be like the rich man asking for a drip of water on his tongue to attempt to help a little bit. Even he recognized the value of water, but it was too late. And someone says that we don't have to be baptized to be saved. I have to question and ask, what did Jesus do? And why did he do it? Maybe one day I'll get an answer to that, but I hadn't got one yet. Do we see the importance of water? You know, during the summertime, we always say stay hydrated. Stay hydrated year round is always a good idea. We put an extra emphasis on it when it gets hot outside. When we get weary in our spirit, do we stay hydrated in the Word of God? Do we go to Him for our strength, for our encouragement? That's the encouragement of tonight. Make sure you get enough water. Make sure you get enough of God's Word. Study it each day. Let's work on building up our knowledge of it through Bible study, through gathering together, through encouraging one another. If anyone has needed the invitation for whatever reason, we offer it now while together we stand and sing.